24. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 to 44, again, this is the Lord's Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. And uh, this final section is we'll move on after this text to other prophetic texts in the New Testament. But we are taking an overview look at this text, specifically with reference to eschatology. And this is an eschatological text in particular as the Lord discusses end times and the and his soon coming with his disciples. And to remind us of our context now as we get into the text in Matthew 24, the Lord is seated on the western slope of the Mount of Olives. He's overlooking Jerusalem, overlooking the temple complex, and he's with his disciples when he makes the startling pronouncement in chapter 24, verse 2, that the temple that they're looking at, the buildings accompanying the temple, will soon be destroyed. The temple will be thrown down. Now, upon that pronouncement, his disciples, startled, troubled, certainly by the, the Lord's words, come to him privately, asking him two essential questions then in verse 3. The first, when will these things be? The second in verse 3, what will be the sign of your coming and of the, a- the end of the age? Again, using language that is simultaneously historical relative to A.D. 70 and the historical destruction of the temple that we already are aware of, as well as language that is eschatological relative to the very end of the age and his second coming, the Lord then gives characteristics of a period of tribulation that describes our church age in verses 4 through 14. That, followed by a period of great tribulation, including the sign of his coming, And at the end of the age, in verses 15 to 28, note again there, the simultaneously historical and eschatological language is being used. And then in verses 29 through 31, immediately after the tribulation of those days, you will see various signs in the heavens. Cosmic imagery foreshadowed by Old Testament cosmic imagery of judgment. And those alive at that time will see the Son of Man then coming, you could say, post-tribulationally. On the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now this series of events from chapter 24 verse 4 to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is further summarized then in the parable of the fig tree from verses 32 to 35. And that brings us then this evening to the Lord's instruction in verses 36 through 44. Look at verse 36 with me. The Lord begins, but of that day, the day of his coming, right? Of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. The emphasis with that statement in verse 36 is that life goes on as it has gone on. Life goes on as it has. In other words, we are to be watchful, we are to be vigilant during this time when life simply progresses on as it has progressed on. Life goes on as it has. A lesson, as John Broda states it, is this. If the Son Himself does not know the time of His second coming, how cheerfully should we, His followers, rest in ignorance that cannot be removed, trusting all things to our Heavenly Father's wisdom and goodness, striving to obey His clearly revealed will and leaning on His goodness for support. In other words, we're left, if you will, not knowing the time or the hour, not knowing the day or the hour, we're left to just trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. The Lord knows when, right? We don't need to be speculating about that. We don't need to be looking for uh, clues and events to try to pinpoint that time. You know, it says here that we won't know the day and hour, but certainly we can know the month or the year. No, it's not saying that either. It's saying exactly the opposite. We, it does not mean that. We can't know, all right? We can't know. And so that leaves us then, by God's wise design, that leaves us dependent upon the Lord, trusting in the Lord, and watchful. If you consider these texts as we've been walking through the Olivet Discourse, uh, much of the point, much of the theme that's being repeated here is that of watchfulness, of vigilance. We need to be watching. We need to be heeding the Lord's warnings. We need to be watching for His second coming. We need to be paying attention to how we live. We'll look at that more as we work through this particular text tonight, right? It simply means that we don't know. We're dependent upon God. We're to be watchful, vigilant, dependent upon Him, trusting Him for when these events will take place. Now, verse 36 does not mean 
that Jesus is somehow less than God in his incarnation, or that somehow Jesus Christ has emptied himself of his divinity. Jesus Christ is both fully God with all the attributes of God, and yet he is fully man. Look with me at Philippians chapter 2. Let's explain this portion of our text. Philippians chapter 2. Jesus God, Jesus is fully God and yet fully man. Philippians chapter 2. In the text we're familiar with, look with, with me beginning at verse 5. Where Paul says, Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Jesus Christ is God. Verse 7. But he made himself of no reputation. He made himself of no reputation, taking upon himself, you could say, taking the form of a slave, a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. In other words, Jesus Christ took to himself the form of a slave. He came in the likeness of men, but he did not empty himself of his deity. He did not empty himself of his deity. He became dependent upon the Father. He became obedient to the Father. That obedience to the Father rendered in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And his divested knowledge of the day or hour then of his return has more to do with his humiliation, more to do with his incarnation, rather than some supposed giving up of his deity. Lord Jesus Christ didn't give up any of his deity. Right? It's more to do with his humiliation and his incarnation. Now this... Coming, referenced in verse 36, that we don't know about, that no one knows the day or the hour of, is also associated with a warning. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. This coming also associated with a warning. I'm sure this will be a text that Pastor Rick takes a look at here soon. 2 Peter chapter 3. Look at verse 1. And here this sets the stage for what comes next in the Olivet Discourse. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Beloved, Peter says, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first. That scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, and saying, Where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Now for us, God's people, when we see the command in association with end times and his second coming, we're to watch, we're to be vigilant, we're to be taking heed to the words of the Lord, taking heed to the word of God, ordering our lives appropriately, we're to watch. These don't watch. They, in a sense, are sleepwalking. Where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. This, verse 5, Peter says, they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. But, verse 7, the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But listen, beloved, verse 8, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This coming, mentioned in verse 36 back in Matthew 24, is associated with a warning. Don't be like the scoffers. That's the warning. 
Don't be like the scoffers. Everything is just continuing as it always has, and they willfully, willfully forget the flood. Right? The world at that time that then existed perished being flooded with water. The world that now exists is reserved for fire. Judgment is coming. What manner of people then ought we to be? How should we then live considering these truths? We'll talk about that further. Look at verse 37 back in, back in Matthew 24. Having given us that warning, we continue with that in verse 37. Verse 36, of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But, it's further explaining verse 36, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. We're going to draw a comparison here between the days of Noah and the flood and the time of His second coming and the end of the age. Verse 38, for as in the days before the flood... They were carrying on their lives as usual, as ordinary. Everything was going along as it usually did. They were eating, says in verse 38, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, until the day that judgment fell, right? Until the day that judgment fell. Verse 39, they did not know until the flood came And took them all away. Uh, By comparison, verse 39, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So now he draws a parallel then. We can all see the parallel, right? Draws a parallel between the coming of the Son of Man and the flood in the days of Noah. Two time periods here specifically of judgment. Two time periods of judgment. In other words... The Lord's statement in verse 36 can only be true if life at His second coming is going on as usual. Just as it was in the days prior to the flood. Life is just simply going on as usual. People are doing ordinary things like those listed in verse 38. They're eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. And again, we're faced with the Repeated primary theme of this instruction that the Lord's people are to be ceaselessly watchful, ceaselessly ready for His soon return. The end of the age and the coming of the Son of Man will come suddenly, like a flood, so to speak. It's going to come in a rush. It's going to come in a rush upon normal, everyday, usual life at that time. It will come, you could say, completely unexpectedly. Like the flood in Noah's day, it will rush in upon normal everyday life. The Lord, then explaining the suddenness of this judgment, explains primarily this event with two illustrations beginning in verse 40. Right and here, the primary emphasis being the suddenness of the judgment, verse 40. Then, at that time, at the end, when the coming of the Son of Man will be, When that judgment will come upon the earth, two men, verse 40, will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. In other words here, the separation of the two isn't the primary point. The fact that one is taken and one remains isn't the primary point. It's the unexpected and sudden nature of the separation that is the primary point. You'll have two together, two together in a field, and in a moment, one's taken, the other is left. Two women grinding at the meal, sitting opposite the grinding stone, turning the stone together, one will be taken, the other left. It'll happen suddenly. It'll happen simultaneously, right? Separating those who are even next to each other. The context, the context requires that we read the separation as judgment. We need to be really, really clear about that. This is a text that's often used by many to talk about a pre-tribulational rapture of the church. It simply has nothing to do with that. The separation here happens in a moment, and we, in context, must read the separation as judgment. In verse 39, the flood came... And took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. 
right? In verse 37. So also will be the case of judgment when the Son of Man comes. I want you to notice something with me. Very interesting here. Two different words used for taking in this text. Look at verse 39. Word in verse 39 is iro. Iro, taking up, taking away. Referring to the flood, taking them away in judgment. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. Iro, took them all away and took them all away in judgment, verse 39, right? And then he says, so also will be the case in judgment when the Son of Man comes. But I want you to notice in verse 40 and in verse 41... The word for taken here is paralambano. Paralambano means to take along or to take with. Verse 40, two men will be in the field. One will be paralambano, taken, and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the meal. One will be paralambano, taken, and the other left. Take along with or taken with. It has the sense of accompaniment or association. Okay, now follow along with me. Two days later, after the Lord gives this discourse on the Mount of Olives, two days later in the upper room, in John chapter 14, verse 3, Jesus uses the same word, paralambana, to explain in John chapter 14, verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you, paralambano, to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. If we hold these words as distinct and not synonymous and we understand them in context and here's the sense of what's being said one will be taken along paralambano as in the rapture of believers taken along with the lord jesus christ the other will be left and swept away in judgment the other left and swept away as in the flood of noah Still comports well with the illustration of Noah, where he and his family are taken away in the ark, the others left to face the judgment of the flood. All right? But in verse 40, verse 41, one will be taken in judgment, or one will be taken away, paralambano, with the Lord, one will be left in judgment. Again, the emphasis still, based upon verses 37, 38, and 39, the emphasis on judgment, one left in judgment facing, so to speak, not the judgment of the flood this time, but the judgment of fire. Again, as we look at the text, it begs the question then, when is the chronology, when in the chronology of eschatological events does this judgment take place? And again, the answer in the context of Matthew chapter 24 is post-tribulation, after the tribulation period, right? If you notice... Matthew chapter 24, verse 37. You have Matthew chapter 24, verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Referencing specifically the coming of the Son of Man at the end of the age. If you look at that language in verse 37, look back at verse 30. Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. This is after the tribulation of those days, after the great tribulation described in verses 15 to 28. Then you have verse 30, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. This judgment takes place post-tribulation, after the tribulation. Look back at verse 27, verse 26. At the end of the great tribulation, therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Again, that's after, at the end of the great tribulation. Make sense? So again, after the tribulation of that time, you have this coming of the Son of Man in judgment. Where... Just as in the days of Noah, life is going on as normal, eating, drinking, giving in marriage. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken at the coming of the Lord. One left to face judgment. Two women will be grinding at the mill at the coming of the Lord, at the coming of the Son of Man. One will be taken, the other left in judgment to face the fire. Again, this is given to us, this chronology, in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Turn there with me. 
2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Again, in Matthew chapter 24, there's simply no reference, no text whatsoever that could support or would identify specifically a pre-tribulational rapture of the church. It simply isn't in the text. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him... We're talking about the coming of the Lord and the rapture, right? Our gathering together to Him. Listen to the chronology. Paul asks them not to be soon shaken, verse 2, in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. What's the day of Christ? It's the day of His coming and our gathering together to Him, right? The day of His coming and our gathering together to Him. Verse 3, let no one deceive you by any means. For that day, what day is it? The day of His coming and our gathering together to Him. That day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now if you think through Second Thessalonians chapter 2, specifically there verse 4, Put your hand on that text and go back to Matthew chapter 24 and look at verse 15. This lines up with what the Lord describes as the great tribulation beginning in verse 15, where he says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down or take anything out of his house. Verse 21, for then there will be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor shall ever shall be, nor ever shall be. Unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. If anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I've told you beforehand. It's after this time period, right? After this time period being described by the Lord in Matthew 24, that the Son of Man comes, and He comes in judgment, and He comes in the judgment described in our text, verse 40, two men in the field, one taken, the other left to face judgment. Two women grinding at the mill, one taken, the other left to face judgment. Back in Second Thessalonians, if you look at verse 4, this one, this abomination of desolation, opposes, exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Paul says, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know that what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time, the mystery, verse 7, of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Again, this lawlessness, this lawless one at the end of the tribulation, at the end of the age will be destroyed by the Lord at his coming. Right. And that's according to the working of Satan, verse 9, with all powers, signs, and lying wonders. Remember what the Lord said in Matthew chapter 24 with respect to false Christ, false prophets rising and doing great signs and wonders to deceive, if it were possible, even the elect, right? And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth and they might be saved. Again... Chronologically, what we're talking about in Matthew chapter 24, specifically the judgment referred to in verses 40 and 41, is after the tribulation period. After the tribulation period. Again, there's simply nowhere in Scripture is there ever even suggested by a text a pre-tribulational rapture of the church. Just simply isn't in the text. The text ends in Matthew chapter 24 with warnings considering the time of His coming. Thinking of these things, considering these things, 
the Lord gives us warning. Look at verse 42, Matthew chapter 24, verse 42. The Lord says, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. It's in this one respect only that the Lord's unexpected sudden coming, I could the Lord here in his return be compared to a thief. It's the only, only place where that could be possible. But what's the intent or the purpose of this instruction? That is clear from the parallel passage in Mark. Look at Mark 13 with me. What's the, the purpose or the intent or the emphasis of the instruction? Look at Mark 13. And look down at verse 32. Mark 13, verse 32. Right, we see, see parallel language here beginning in verse 32. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Watch the repetitive use of language here, beginning in verse 33. The Lord says, take heed, watch, and pray. That's our responsibility during this time, right? As we wait the soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're to take heed, we're to watch, we're to be prayerful. Why? Because we don't know when the time is. That really is, in essence, the purpose of of the Lord's keeping that information back from us in verse 36, back in Matthew 24, right? We don't know the day or the hour. We don't know when the time is. And so verse 33, we take heed, we watch, and we pray. He says in verse 34, it's like a man going to a far country who left his house, gave authority to his servants and to each his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Verse 35, watch therefore, for you don't know when the master of the house is coming. In the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly, he will find you sleeping. You can see all the references to coming suddenly, unexpectedly, watching, eating. You don't know when the time is. You don't know where the hour is. You don't know when the master of the house is coming. Is it going to be at midnight, in the morning, at evening, at the crowing of the rooster? Verse 36, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. We, during this time period, are to watch. We're to watch. We're to be vigilant. We're to labor for the Lord and the cause of the gospel, preaching the gospel to the four corners of the earth until the Lord comes. Verse 37, and what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Notice in Mark 13 that the warning that focuses on that day really is given as a threat. It's given as a threat. You don't know when the master's coming. So we need to be watchful. We need to take heed. We need to be vigilant. There are other texts, other texts that talk about the joy of believers that is coming. Right? And we pray for that. We pray for the Lord's coming. Um, we take his coming as both a cause of great joy and a heed to watch, a heed of, of, of text of warning. We're to look for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, right? That's Paul's letter to Titus. And we're to look at his second coming as a warning to watch, a warning to watchfulness. Consider the comparative exhortation of Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. Listen. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, Peter says, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God... Because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. You see the combination there of watchfulness and joy? Right? We look forward to this according to his promise, but we also watch. We should fear the Lord, taking consideration of how we conduct ourselves in holiness and godliness.
Verse 14, therefore, beloved, therefore, looking forward to these things, be diligent. Be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. Consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, is written to you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware. Here's the tone of warning again, right? Beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness. Don't become apathetic. Don't become lethargic. Don't become sluggardly, right? Don't lose heart. Don't shrink back. Since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But grow, the Lord says, in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, thank you, Lord, for the warnings. Uh, thank you, Lord, for your clear instruction for us to take heed, not to fall uh, according to the example of the wicked, not to fall into the error of the wicked, not to fall into apathy or lethargy or sluggardliness, not to become lazy in the work, or not to sleep on the job, so to speak, not to sit down on our duty, so to speak, not to throw in the towel before we finish the race. Help us, Lord, to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Give us strength, Lord, by your Spirit to not lose heart, to not shrink back, but to press forward in the cause and in this glorious gospel ministry that you've given us. And at the same time, Lord, as we look forward to your coming, taking heed to those warnings that you give us in your word, we also look forward with great joy, hastening the coming of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Come, Lord, come quickly. We love you. We look forward, Lord, to that time when your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven for your glory, for your everlasting praise and worship, and for our good, for our joy in you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.